Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, so I said that at the end of the review of the 1995 paper of Takake Matsumoto, uh, where he said that there was a highly magnetic aspect of these ring clusters, and this was because there is a, a loop current in them, and that this may explain the uh, magnetization of non-magnetic materials and he was talking about uh, platinum uh, in that um, I said that I would explore the magnetic nature or signature of strange radiation uh, a little more this week and I think it's very 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 key to understanding what is going on in low energy nuclear reactions anyway I've just got a couple of examples here you may have other ones and they may not be exactly the right date so uh, if you have uh, some extra context or extra people that I should include in this list this PDF of the slide will be included in the description of the video however you will be able to uh, um, suggest updates to it where I can include uh, into the PDF uh, further uh, people that should be considered in links to relevant uh, papers. But anyway, um, I think the first on the list should be uh, John Hutchison and his uh, Tesla experiments where he saw some non-magnetic materials such as stainless steel and other materials becoming magnetic. Now, there is an aspect to this where you are actually transmuting material into materials that would be magnetic. So is it necessarily because it is becoming magnetic? and it's still a non-magnetic material? Or is it because there's actually materials in there that have been synthesized that are now able to be magnetic? Anyway, um, uh, one thing that was noticed though, which was very interesting, is this north, north, south, south kind of um, uh, observation. And I have explained this in one way, um, where um, the exotic vacuum objects grow in a certain point and then they push the material apart because they've got north north and south south facing each other but of course if they were monopoles then um there is uh, some people that say that it could be due to monopoles anyway we have uh, also as i had done in the previous presentation observed by takake takaaki matsumoto in 1993 and 4 and he published that so uh, john hutchison uh, wasn't necessarily publishing but uh, he was probably first to the table in the modern era uh, of this but then like i say there may be other people out there that actually produced materials rather than hypothesis of this um but uh, where matsumoto should be given credit is he actually went out of his way to publish these findings in 1993-94 now um Aretzka, uh, observed uh, this in the late 1990s and early 2000s and he did publish uh, this work was replicated uh, by uh, Davio uh, et al and this was published in 2013 and these I'm going to discuss these two papers in this presentation I've already discussed uh, where Fredericks published this in 2013 however he does claim that he observed these kind of tracks uh, early uh, earlier than probably anyone else apart from John Hutchison and that was in 1980 um, however um, he may have published earlier but uh, certainly published in 2013 and I've referred to that presentation in previous presentations um, I published basically as fast as I could in 2017 and uh, saw, saw um, some magnetic uh, control of this strange radiation when I was trying to guide uh, the uh, radiation using uh, a neodymium magnet uh, that was coming out of echo fuel and observed the tracks on a uh, non-contact piece of plastic and also um, separately in a webcam uh, of the same kind of structure that's been observed elsewhere however that didn't have a magnet in place but the one that did have a magnet in place um, uh, that was uh, on uh, polymer that was between the fuel source and the magnet and then Baranoff and Zatalepin had done experiment also in 2017, which uh, they published recently in 2020, uh, effectively via me, but to their community uh, in an online uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and I have the link there. Anyway, into the papers. Uh, so this is a paper that actually um, I, I have a lot of fondness for. Um, and it was... Uh, uh, reminded to me by uh, uh, Alan Smith 
uh, today. And this was published in uh, 2013, and it's the Analyse de la Fondance, Fondation Louis de Broglie. Um, so this is a group that uh, is uh, supporting research, and uh, I just want to read a couple of key points from this and, uh, and, and discuss them as we go. So almost 15 years ago, uh, Leonid uh, Roizkov, I think I've got that right, uh, et al. published their findings about radiation emitted by high voltage pulse discharges in water. So this is 2013, nearly 15 years ago. That would have been at the end of uh, the 1990s. So after the uh, actual publication of this kind of observations by Takaaki Matsumoto. And in fact, Takaaki Matsumoto effectively published strange radiation tracks before he realized that, <laughs> um, what he was seeing. Um, anyway, the various properties of emitted radiation shown in these different experiments point toward the assumption that the associated particles carry a magnetic charge. Um, and so the create note here the creation of such particles does not necessarily require high energy accelerators and this apparently was theorized by Georges Loschek uh, and that was in 1983 so this is subsequent to the work of, uh, of um, uh, John Hutchison and uh, the work that wasn't published uh, of Ken Shoulders at that time uh, but uh, Georges was uh, theorizing about these and uh, so I just want to pull out some various aspects and we, we, we'll go to look at the uh, precedent paper by um, Roitzkov. So basically they had a containing vessel, they exploded something in the containing vessel in the, in the liquid uh, and uh, it was demineralized water or unmineralized water as they call it. Call it. Um, the films are exposed in two different ways. Firstly, these are the, the um, uh, X-ray films or the uh, X-ray emulsions or the nuclear emulsions. Firstly, they can be uh, placed in the vicinity around about 50 centimeters of the container and thus exposed during a very short time, showing relatively few tracks. A second method initiated by L. Roitzkov et al. consists of in putting the content, the water, and powder resulting from the fusion of the wire. Well, it's the, the interaction of the electricity with the wire because it's not necessarily just fusion. Uh, uh, of the inside container, that's the bit inside here where the action happened, in a small glass cup, six centimeter diameter, placing the X-ray film on top of it, a few millimeters above the water surface and waiting a score of hours. So a score is about 20 hours. More tracks are recorded in that case. So what they are saying is that the water is activated in some way that allows it to expose uh, X-ray film uh, after the reaction. And this is exactly what uh, was done by uh, Lion in the Lion reactors. He took out his cold reactor after the thing had cooled down and put it into some X-ray uh, film, okay, uh, or cl close to some X-ray film. So these are the kind of tracks, um, and these look like just straight line tracks, but there's actually sometimes more to them. Um, these can be very short and ring-like, uh, uh, a property which could be due to applied electric field. So this is in figure three. So if you look at uh, figure three, there's an assumption here by them that uh, there's an electric field, and so these things are magnetic, so they kind of spin on themselves. I don't think that that is the case. I think it's something that's coming down and hitting the surface. Anyway, that's what they wait, what they think, and they've got this other one here, um, which is uh, something like the strings that uh, um, uh, Matsumoto saw, but actually he observed these kind of structures, and he was saying when the torus kind of breaks, you end up with these uh, un connected strings and he, he observed this in his papers as well in the 1990s early 1990s now actually this track particular track here is essentially identical to the uh, first track that I observed coming out of a cavitation spot uh, on the first uh, plate that I was given by uh, Roishin Amaza so um, it's certainly something that can come from cavitation. Now, you could imagine that in an exploding wire in water, there would be some cavitation. So, 
Could it be a cavitation effect that caused this type of structure? That is something that one must consider when we are looking at these things. These elongated tracks may be also discontinuous as showed on figure four below. So basically every single track that you see here is on the uh, Roy Shinomaza vibrator plates. Now um, there are also observations of these uh, discontinuous characters uh, and also these tra tread, tire tread type uh, tracks that you can see here and ones where it splits off uh, into sections and so those are things to consider. And also sometimes where they, they produce like two tracks where one track is not quite the same as the other and comes down, changes direction, changes form. Um, Finally, the tracks are often double, as observed already by Aridskov. So this is their replication of Aridskov's work, uh, who considered this feature characteristic of this novel radiation. Uh, one of the tracks has much lower intensity, as if it were a duplicate of the other, as shown on figure 7, or has the same origin, uh, and so on. So he's talking about these, where you this is kind of like this track, but uh, it... It uh, follows along, it's parallel to it, uh, but it's less intense. Now, it, that they do note here, which is good, this latter feature is also a feature of mechanical scratches, i.e. three body interactions or just mechanical scratches on the film surface, which are also present on our films and sometimes difficult to distinguish from tracks and have similar appearance on these pictures taken with optical microscope. This point is important as it indicates that the tracks are not due to silver grains uh, as is usual with ionizing radiation, but are rather grooves dug into the film, as will be seen in detail in the next section. Now, they account for this, and this will allow us to return to the work of Alexander Parkamov. Anyway, so they, they look at this one of the particular tra tracks here, and this is one of the uh, long tracks. So that what they're actually doing is they are looking at... Um, one of the very first tracks here and they're looking at this end of this track where there's a break in it and so uh, they do studies with the various different tools uh, and uh, they can actually see that rather than just being a straight line it has this uh, detail in it and that it has a break here and so forth and it actually has some depth and again you can see they're using a confocal uh, microscope like I like I used on the material that was exposed to echo radiation where I used a magnet to guide that and and so forth here um, and it's a very very interesting presentation uh, sort of video to look through but here is the um, the key point here so that they're actually looking at this with uh, a different type of um, uh, camera it says uh, this track consists in two deep, more than five, five, 50 micron pits, seemingly at the origin of two double tracks, starting in opposite directions and confined to the sensitive layer of the film, less than 20 micrometers deep. One also sees other, also double tracks, crossing the main one. With the two devices, these tracks uh, look like grooves similar to scratches, but, in our opinion, impossible to confuse with scratches because they start in opposite directions. So that's one thing. And then they say, and the next observations, figure 11, will show this information is not always true and the precise shape is rather a tunnel dug in the outer layer of the film. So this is kind of a little bit like that that was published in EV, A Tale of Discovery, which I referred to when looking at the uh, observations of... Um, uh, Alexander Parkamov and you can see it here so we, we, he's kind of zooming into this part of this track here and when you look at it it's actually got a tunnel dug under the film so this is very similar to that um, observed by um, Alexander Parkamov uh, and also as published in EV A Tale of Discovery by Ken Shoulders and so this can't be necessarily three body interaction um, because it's it's a burrowed layer underneath. So if I actually uh, go to uh, the work of Parkamov here, you can see that in this one it's periodic, but it's actually burrowing underneath, burrowing underneath. 
And uh, in this particular one is the one that I was referring to, which is actually in the middle of the glass. And the only near observation uh, was this one, where there's actually a film on top and it's actually uh, burrowing underneath that film in, in a channel, but the, the, the Evo is big enough so that it's actually changing the Illumina or whatever it is on the top of there. And so that is actually quite similar to this observation by um, the uh, people in Deval that is um, uh, actually doing a replication of the work of Aroidskev. So other SEM images, figure 12, show clearly the complexity of the track, suggesting that different objects have travelled together, one under the surface, but above the substrate, the other above the film, leaving periodical imprints on the surface. This feature is visible on figures 4 and 5. Similar tracks have also been observed on hard materials, such as aluminium or silicon, by Adamenko SV and Vysotsky VI. Now, this is the one. So you have this one, which is kind of like part under the surface and part impression and then you have this other one which is on top of the surface now how could this be well i have have suggested in my presentation when i was looking at parkamov's work that it is these kind of structures so uh, like these kind of bead chains as observed by uh, shoulders and you could you could understand that if you had um, let's say this is rotating this way and this one's rotating this way and this one's rotating this way so they they alternately rotate let's say around the, the ring um, and uh, as as this is rather than hitting the surface like this it was scratching along the surface like we see here uh, so it's kind of rotating like this um, but instead of rotating the, you've just got the sub rotations as well as observed on video by the um, author uh, Bogdanovich et al. So you have these structures which are moving, rotating, rolling, and then the substructures are rotating. So if these are rotating and, and the overall structure isn't actually rotating, but these things are rotating. This one's under the surface, and this one maybe over here is kind of like slightly above the surface, but every time it rotates a bit, it dips into the surface. So, so for instance, let's say I don't know, this one is under the surface and uh, and this one isn't, but th or that one isn't. And then it's this bit that's running along the surface. I I'm trying to get across how effectively you could make this. So there's actually a much bigger like ring uh, bead chain that's scraping along the surface here. Um, um, but it's not changing its orientation. It's kind of like just got, it's, it's kind of almost like a hydrofoil uh, boat if you can imagine and two of them are enough to kind of lock it in place if you if you had one it was kind of like it wobble about but if one comes down it's kind of bouncing along the surface so you've got one hydrofoil here which is cutting through the waves and periodically bits are coming up as it's the, the substructure is rotating around and this one is only just tapping the surface as it's going along but it allows a, a parallel track to be formed of this so-called complex nature and um, this is another interesting one, which also supports the theories of um, Ken Shoulders. Uh, you have a hole here, uh, which you can see this pit in the confocal microscope, or the whatever the uh, um, yeah, it's confocal image. And so it's kind of like the the thing has come in, and then it's gone in, and it's gone to a certain depth, and it's kind of almost rotated, and and then travelled along uh, on in or on the surface. And so this is um, probably. Uh, this this is effectively what Scholder's saying. It's kind of like hits the surface and then it, it travels along the surface. And so this is really telling you that lots of thin layers are probably a good way to protect yourself from strange radiation. Okay. Uh, a curvature of a track in, in a uniform fixed electric field seems to be the best um, indication of the presence of a magnetic charge. Okay, so this is talking about the magnetic nature so some properties of light magnetic monopoles. First of all, these tracks are always produced in association with an electric breakdown, implying the production of an intense magnetic field. And so I'm saying here, high uh, rate of change of high current. So that's a, a pulse of intense current in a very short period of time. So it's kind of essentially, essentially what they're saying here. And this is actually how Shoulders would create his... Um, 
uh, evos is he would have a, a, a you know a dielectric and, and and a cathode here and an anode plate below and kind of there would, would there would be a breakdown of the dielectric and you'd suddenly get a pulse and that's how you'd create the evo so essentially the same with shoulders matsumoto hutchison hutchison would uh, always have a spark gap <laughs> which is the dielectric is the air or he he would have like a um, a xenon or ex military sort of floodlight arc, arc light uh, with two tungsten electrodes and he would be sparking between there so you've got a breakdown in there um, in their simplest form they obey quantum dynamics equations corresponding to magnetically charged neutrinos with no mass now this is according to the work of George Loshak in 1984 so the idea that neutrinos could be uh, um, what they could be comprised of is not something necessarily that uh, was first uh, um, understood by Shishkin et al. Um, uh, the no mass thing, I don't know about that. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the mass of neutrinos. Certainly at the time that this was written, uh, one still would argue that they had no mass uh, because they hadn't had a chance to review the work of uh, Alexander Parkhamov in Space Earth Human. So, um, you know, but regardless, they are calling it as neutrinos. So really you, you have many, many authors now that are believing that uh, there is a, a highly magnetic nature to this and that neutrinos play a role. And so effectively magnetically charged neutrinos. Uh, monopoles seem to be able to be trapped inside matter. Now this is something that uh, uh, is said by shoulders. Uh, they get stuck in there. Creating heavy magnetically charged composite particles or modifying the magnetic properties of crystals. So there we go. They are saying that the matter is changed. Uh, either it's grouping particles together uh, or that these strange particles are grouping together and they're highly magnetic uh, or that they're changing the magnetic property of the crystals. As we have said, the remains of the wire, a metallic powder dispersed in water, is placed in a shallow glass dish 10 centimeters in diameter. Part of the metallic powder is composed of spongy particles which float on the surface. As they contain some iron, they follow a magnet being moved near the surface with a velocity not exceeding a few millimeters per second. So here we go. This is water, titanium and an explosion. So uh, there were synthesized some iron and I will probably talk about this tomorrow as I'm short on time, uh, but effectively uh, they, they were seeing uh, uh, iron synthesis from titanium and uh, they were able to use this magnet and, and move these spongy particles that were floating around on the surface. But then, he says, a completely different behaviour has been observed twice. As the magnet was approaching, one of these particles, size uh, 0.1 of a millimetre, crossed the dish so quickly that the magnet did not have time to be moved during that fraction of a second. Its estimated velocity was about 10 centimetres a second, i.e. 100 times the usual velocity. The only explanation in accord with the, in accord with the laws of electromagnetism and fluid mechanics seems to be the presence of a magnetic charge on the particle. Magnetic dipoles cannot behave this way. Anyway, they're at least saying it's highly magnetic. So, you know, if I, if I had a, a neodymium particle or a just an iron ferrite kind of magnetized particle i would suggest that the neodymium particle would uh, move a lot lot uh, faster um so at least it's uh, more magnetic um but they're saying that dipoles can't behave this way uh, well yeah maybe <laughs> um uh, firstly, it can be noted that the exposition of films on top of the dish containing the remains of the discharge suggests that the particles emitting, emitted or escaping the matter where they were stored, and uh, as there is no signs of any nuclear reaction, uh, must possess only low energy. So uh, they are su suggesting here that uh, the, the, there's something coming out of the, um, the material that uh, is the aftermath of these exploding wires or films um, uh, that is stored in the material but then gets ejected um, but the, the, there's no kind of uh, exposure to um, normal kinds of radiation that you might expect 
saying if we compare with similar tracks left by alpha particles on film, for instance, the energy necessary to carve the groove shown on figures 11 or 12 should be in the mega electron volt range. Furthermore, the curvature changes sign uh, the curvature changes sign on some tracks, figures four and six. Uh, thus, it seems difficult to explain how the tracks are produced. Well, um, I, I can kind of suggest that if you have, um, uh, you know, some of these substructures, some of these substructures are breaking away. Um, you know, it could change the balance of the overall cluster. And, and 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 make it move slightly differently. Uh, so possible explanations have been given, but they imply local nuclear reactions, which may also be occurring, or even more exotic phenomena like small ball lightnings. And in our opinion, these questions remain open. Well, I think you know if I'm if I'm looking at, for instance, uh, these kind of splitting, uh, we've seen splitting on the fuel container in. Uh, the work of Echo uh, when we looked at that in 2017 and also Matsumoto saw uh, splitting uh, yeah, very similar to these kind of branching effects and I, I would imagine that it is a large cluster and one substructure is breaking off or a bead ring and one structure is breaking off and uh, this is called, causing a rebalancing and a bit of recall uh, and uh, re sort of uh, self-organization and you get um, these kind of branching effects. And I, I imagine that uh, maybe this will change the overall polar nature of the material and so that, or, or of the cluster. So if it changes its uh, uh, magnetic nature, then it might flip its field, as it were, as a polar flip. Um, so where are we? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Have you done that? Wave-like behavior and chirality. If the observed monopoles are massless, magnetically excited neutrinos of George Loshak, they are described by a spinoral equation which differs from Dirac's by its gauge instead of Dirac's one, this one. This equation has been split by Georges Loshak into two separate uncoupled equations by mean of Wales transformation and gives rise to two spinors, right and left-handed. The question could be raised of a possible link between this feature and the double tracks observed very often. This chirality is also suggested by the shape of the dots in the dotted lines, like those on figure 6, 7 or 15. So I'm just going to have a look at these ones. Essentially... There's two lines, and if you look at the top line, it's kind of going back on itself, and on the bottom line, it's going forward. So it's like a backslash and a forward slash, and so this shows chirality. Well, we've seen chirality, haven't we? We've seen chirality here, and we've seen chirality in many other uh, uh, sort of structures. So this has a, a spin on it. This has a spin on it. Um, and so we've often seen these double double tracks, but these are what I call the the daddyo things, where you have um, these very large structures that appear to have some sort of chirality going on with them. Conclusion: The results given in this paper are certainly incomplete, tentative, and able to be much improved. But these tracks have been observed so many times in different laboratories and show enough original features to justify uh, this detailed presentation, even if we have no precise explanation for their appearance. And then he looks at ones that go left and right. So anyway, I would recommend you go and read this paper and I will talk about another related paper tomorrow. So thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.